This story begins in an office, where the protagonist works in the advertising department of the company Big Glory. What a name for a company, right? Sounds like a magic card name. The protagonist is one of those people who live solely for work, and his boss threatens him, saying the company is laying off a lot of people, and he needs to make an effort. The boss even gives him a list of potential clients to call. Despite being very tired, the protagonist starts typing until something strange happens. A strange image appears on the computer computer screen and everything starts to distort. When his coworker asks if Howard is okay, the protagonist, with his hand over his eyes, takes a moment to respond but says he's fine. Howard's coworker reminds him not to forget that they have dinner with the boss tonight. It might sound nice, but the protagonist thinks it sucks because in the end, they have to split the bill, and for him, who earns pearly, it's not worth it. His coworker notices that he's not into it, and offers to lend him some money. Seriously, what a great coworker. He mentions that the new director will be introduced today, so they can't afford to miss it. And speaking of her, look who's coming. Her name is Sabrina Luo, and as she passes by, the guys are all dumbstruck, and the protagonist says that this woman is out of this world for someone like him. A few hours later, everyone is celebrating and socializing with their co-workers, everyone laughing and eating peacefully. But the protagonist starts to have the same problem he had at the office, and his iris starts turning blue, and suddenly his nervous system was connected to some kind of system, and an image above him that only he could see. And the image begins to say, Of course they can't see us. Star Universe Limited strives to bring the best experience to its customers and achieve groundbreaking innovations based on virtual reality. We calculate and design for all sensory organs, including your mind. That's why we are capable of silent communication. But the protagonist, not understanding anything, says he never bought anything virtual reality related and doesn't have money for it. But the image continues. You will be the tester of our specially made dreamland, where you will have many different life experiences. Think of it as the high-end version of a VR game. Throw it flashback. The protagonist, like any other softie, says he doesn't want any of that and that he has to go to work tomorrow. So the robot tells him that the system is capable of taking a copy of each person from real life and if he wouldn't like to live life as a different person. But before the protagonist can respond, his boss arrives with the new director Sabrina to introduce her. The boss introduces her to the employee who's the biggest suck-up he has. When it's the protagonist's turn, the director asks him his name, and he starts to introduce himself, but is interrupted by the boss saying he's nobody and that he has mediocre skills. But in reality, it's all a lie because we see that the protagonist was indeed very skilled but didn't suck up to the boss, so he resented him. Then the director says she understands and leaves with the boss. The protagonist's colleague feels a little sorry for him. When it's time to leave, everyone starts saying goodbye. Howard is upset saying he worked so hard but wasn't recognized. His friend tries to console him saying that to be recognized you just have to suck up to the boss. But in a flashback we see that this guy was a leader defending students back in school. And the protagonist says that now he is totally different from what he was before. He succumbed to the system. Then the boss appears telling the director she doesn't need to waste time with the insignificant ones. But she doesn't pay much attention to him and says she knows what she's doing and the protagonist overhears everything. The boss realizing he heard gives him a hint about people who deserve to be fired. Howard gets angry and says he'll resign tomorrow. But to calm him down he asks the system to send copies of the boss and the director to this dreamland. Errors in the instructions, the system, can only scan one person at a time based on the requests made. The system determined that the target to be scanned will be Sabrina. The protagonist is caught off guard and the robot says the scanning on Sabrina is complete. When Howard gets home he gets mad at the robot because it didn't say before that it could only scan one person at a time. The system detected a strong increase in dopamine in your brain. The conclusion is, you're loving it. Howard is embarrassed by the truth thrown in his face. But he's not wrong, who wouldn't want a hot woman as an NPC in their game? The robot says the system will be activated at midnight, so the protagonist needs to find a safe place to sleep. Howard says that's easy. The problem is he's too nervous to sleep, but the robot says it was expecting that and will interfere with the part of his brain that activates sleep and will make him sleep. Then the system starts and Howard starts seeing things as his heart races, but he falls asleep. 
and in the blink of an eye, he wakes up on the ground, and right in front of him is a woman with cyberpunk-style leg bands. The woman introduces herself as AI-63, an artificial intelligence and administrator of the Dreamland system. Howard is somewhat confused, and the woman explains to him about a shop system and credits where he can buy things that might be useful in the future, such as a knife that costs 2 credits, a truck that costs 40 credits, a temperature-controlling jacket that costs 20 credits, a food package that costs 1 credit, or even an infinite energy battery costing 200 credits. The woman explains that as he completes challenges, he will earn points, and he asks if he has any NPCs he can use. She replies that with 10,000 points she herself would be at the protagonist's service. She informs him that the dreamland is about to begin, and if he has no other questions, to prepare as a portal to an apocalyptic world has opened in front of him, and he is sucked into the portal. But he wakes up in his bed, so he wonders if what happened was real or not. However, as he woke up at home, he believes it was just a delusion on his part and goes to take a shower to go to work. But the bathroom has no power, so he changes and goes downstairs from his building. When he steps onto the sidewalk, the street is strange with debris and empty vehicles. He also doesn't see anyone nearby, but he starts to hear a noise that gets louder and louder until suddenly, an out-of-control plane appears and crashes right in front of him. The plane explodes and the protagonist is thrown away but manages to survive by hiding behind a car. The Mimic Dreamland Doomsday Survival has started. What would you do to survive if all the people in the world suddenly vanished? The difficulty level is zero. You have 180 days to fight this battle. The protagonist doesn't stay in shock, saying, What do you mean, 180 days? But as Howard complains, the sound of liquid dripping sounds in his ear, and when he crouches down, he realizes it's gasoline leaking from the car. Another explosion throws him once again. A little while later, and the protagonist, feeling a bit calmer, comments that another plane crashed into a building after the incident we witnessed. And because all the people in the world disappeared, things like this can happen. He's making a list of supplements he considers essential to survive. And since he has 180 days, he'll take the opportunity to have fun, playing loud music on the street, dressing however he wants, and doing whatever he pleases. He also remembers that Sabrina was supposed to be in this world too, but he hasn't found her yet. The protagonist hears something and looks back to see, but it's just a dog passing by. However, the problem is what's coming behind the dog, none other than a tiger. It lunges at Howard, and to the surprise of both the protagonist and myself, it's friendly. It seems that now that there are no more humans, it escaped from the zoo and has always been raised among humans. So it leaves, and the protagonist is amazed at how detailed this game is. Howard starts having difficulty finding water, and without power, the food starts to spoil, and now there are worms everywhere. Without food, he won't last long. While he's carrying water in his car, he takes the opportunity to loot a restaurant and finds a generator along with a freezer with fresh meat. Now he can make that his shelter. During the day, he loots places, and at night, he plants seeds and fertilizes them with the rotten food. The guy is a genius, but after these 31 days, loneliness starts to mess with the protagonist's head. He starts seeing his friend inside the car with him saying things. Anyone who watched, I am legend, will get the reference. The protagonist says the city has turned into a dump and there are flies everywhere. And at night, he feels worms crawling on his body. He's going really crazy. Suddenly, a light shines on his face, and he breaks abruptly, spinning on the road and hitting none other than Sabrina's car. She finally appears, and now Howard will have someone in place of his mannequin. Sabrina wakes up not knowing where she is, notices that someone has bandaged her, and she's wearing men's clothing. When she leaves the room, she notices the diesel generator and a fresh meal on the table. She finds Howard shaving. After all this time without seeing anyone, he must want to look presentable for her. Howard says he cooked for her and invites her to eat together. She reveals that they already knew each other and asks his name. He introduces himself as Howard Chin and thinks the game also managed to copy her memories. Sabrina is impressed with everything he has done, the electricity, the food. He just says he was lucky and asks how she spent this time. She says everyone had disappeared, and he is the first person she has met since then. Howard asks what her plan is from now on, and she says she still doesn't know what she's going to do. So, he suggests that she move in with him. If she gets sick, 
she would have someone to take care of her, and they could live much better there. Without a better choice in this world, she accepts the offer. But right from the start, she makes it clear that he's not her type, and she wants to keep her distance. The protagonist is incredulous at what he just heard from her, but as the only interaction they have is with Donald, the mannequin, he accepts her terms. Sabrina explains that she won't take advantage of him, and they can share tasks. He says it's a great idea and that they should sleep because they have a lot of work to do the next day. Even without saying anything, he didn't feel good after being rejected by the girl. The next day, Howard wakes up to a loud noise and wonders what Sabrina is doing. He leaves the room and sees a bunch of boxes scattered around, so he asks her what she's doing. She says she's going to use the warehouse as a bedroom, and if he needs her, he can ring the bell. This makes him very irritated, but he controls himself and asks where the mannequin is. According to her, the thing was too scary, so she threw it away. He says she should have asked first. The mannequin was like his Wilson, the only friend he had all this time. In memory of Donald the mannequin, the best and only friend we ever had. Sabrina says she will fetch the mannequin if it's so important, but Howard leaves angrily, saying he'll do it himself. After everyone disappeared, he took some weapons from the police station and put them in a box. And on the first day with the girl, he noticed that a pistol had disappeared. Howard returns to talk to her and says it's better for each of them to wash their own clothes and make their own food, so they'll see each other less. She won't have to be alert all the time, and he won't feel strange when he sees her. Sabrina says that as a woman, she has to protect herself, and even though she's beautiful and rich, he won't be a gentleman just to make her feel good. He really hasn't gotten over her throwing away his doll. He also says that even though he's not a gentleman, he won't hurt her. Three months have passed, the weather is getting colder, and the foul smell has dissipated. Sabrina is tending to the garden. Thanks to her, they now have vegetables to eat. They've hardly spoken since their first fight. She didn't seem to mind, but he can't bear the loneliness. So he talks to the mannequin as if it were a real person. He tells the mannequin they'll look for meat today, asking if they might get sick from eating spoiled meat from the market, or if they could eat rat meat but might die if there's a virus in it. Fortunately, he decides to try his luck fishing. Before going, he visits his other friend at the zoo, who happens to be none other than the tiger, surviving by eating other zoo animals and what little the protagonist brings him. Suddenly, the tiger behaves strangely, running towards some deer nearby. Howard notices that the zoo deer have no antlers, so these must be wild ones invading the city. Heavy rain begins with thunder, and strong winds. The protagonist realizes it's not just a storm but a typhoon approaching. He rushes to the car, asking the mannequin how a typhoon could have formed so quickly, then remembers he's in a game, and the typhoon must be part of some challenge within it. Howard also remembers that Sabrina is out biking in the mountains, and must be near the top by now. He drives back home hoping to find his only real company in this world but only sees the pots she was caring for. All destroyed, the door wide open, and he starts calling for her. With no response, he heads towards the mountain. The typhoon worsens, and he finally finds her. The girl is leaning against a pole, and something happened. She has a serious injury on her leg. She asks if she's going to die as the protagonist carries her. With a serious look, says that's not going to happen. They take shelter from the rain in the mountain mansion. Sabrina is all wet and trembling from the cold, and Howard asks to take a look at her wound, as stubborn as ever, refuses. He angrily tells her she'll end up dying if she keeps it up, but she continues to refuse help, saying she can take care of herself. Howard reveals he has a plan for the situation. Since they don't know how long the typhoon will last, he thinks it's best they move to the mansion, which is higher than the shelter. They need to gather things from there as quickly as possible and bring them to the mansion. As Sabrina is injured, it's better for her to stay in the mansion, and Howard warns her to avoid being poisoned by the smoke from the fire, leaving her irritated for being unable to do anything. The typhoon only grows stronger, Snow even starts to fall, and it's amid this weather that the protagonist leaves the mansion and heads towards the shelter. Upon arrival, the place is flooded, and since the water isn't electrified, the generator has also stopped working. Howard tries to retrieve the vegetables they harvested, but a rush of water and wind carries most of them away. They find themselves in a tough situation, with enough food for only two meals, 
And in the midst of this, fishing or even resorting to rats is impossible. Frustrated with everything that has happened, the protagonist seeks advice from his best friend, the mannequin. With no answers from it, he heads towards his other friend, the zoo tiger. He finds the tiger covered in injuries and asks the tiger to help him hunt. The protagonist says he'll take care of him and tries to get the tiger into the car. But the tiger ignores him, sitting only at the zoo gate. Howard gets irritated, as if he were talking to a person and not an animal, and the tiger responds with a roar. He tells himself he shouldn't care so much about a game, accepts the tiger's decision, and heads to the car, leaving the tiger sitting alone in the middle of the typhoon. Howard is returning to the mansion, trying to sort out his thoughts along the way by conversing with the mannequin. When he arrives, something catches his attention. He stops the car, and Sabrina is lying on the ground. She explains she tried to fetch water to boil for them but fell and can't get up. Naturally, this irritates Howard. He carries the girl to the mansion, leaving her surprised, gives her a slap on the buttocks to scold her, and she yells, saying he'll be making decisions from now on. He throws her onto the bed, telling her he'll fetch the first aid kit, and she better not pull any tricks while he's gone. She screams she can take care of herself, and Howard retorts he's not pleased to have to help her, having enough problems of his own. He needs her to heal quickly to be of any help, or they'll starve. He tends to Sabrina's wound, and she asks what he plans to do now. He reveals he'll try to hunt the wild deer that started invading the city after everyone disappeared. The girl warns that if the deer caught his scent, they'll always be on alert when he approaches. He ponders on this for a moment, saying it doesn't matter much since they have weapons. Speaking of weapons, he found the pistol that had gone missing under her pillow when he went to get supplies at the shelter. He returns it to Sabrina, who asks if it wouldn't be better for him to keep the gun. He says he'll leave the weapon with her as a gesture of trust and bids farewell, needing to prepare for the hunt the next day. It's been 121 days since the game began. The mansion is covered in snow, and the protagonist is preparing for his first hunt. He thinks the deer must be in a suburban area slightly below the mansion, and now feels pressured by Sabrina's words. Having never killed even a chicken, the protagonist isn't confident he can kill a deer. As a precaution, he's also taking some fishing nets. Unbeknownst to him, he's being watched from afar by a pack of wild wolves. Howard arrives at the hunting spot, and the cold is bone-chilling. By the noise, the deer are nearby. He quickly turns, runs towards the sounds, and prepares to shoot, but once again the animals have fled. He's lost count of how many times this has happened. Every time, Howard hears the animals close by, rushes to them, and loses their tracks. He recalls Sabrina's words. It's as if they know all his moves, and he's just wasting time. Tired of the hunt, he heads to a river to try fishing. The current is strong due to the storm, but he's desperate for food and casts the net. The current starts pulling the net, and he tries to hold on tight because it's his only net, and he can't afford to lose it. Suddenly, the net is pulled with great force and he can hold on. Howard is dragged into the middle of the river and falls into the freezing water. The protagonist emerges from the freezing water, trembling with cold, thinking only that he needs to get back home and warm up before he dies of hypothermia. But he spots a deer right in front of him and hides to not be noticed. He can hardly believe it. This is the chance he needed. He searches for the rifle but, unable to find it, he'll have to make do with a shotgun. He aims at the animal, takes a deep breath before shooting, but when he fires, the recoil is stronger than expected and hits his face. The shot hits the tree beside the deer, which manages to escape. Now, in addition to almost freezing, he's also injured his face. Feeling stupid after losing so many resources and getting injured, he wonders if he'll end up starving to death. At that moment, he hears a noise and turns around. Behind him are some wolves, and he grabs the shotgun in case he needs to defend himself, but they realize they might get shot and leave. The protagonist finds it strange that they backed off but decides it's better not to waste more supplies. Howard returns to the mansion and enters the room. Sabrina is warming herself by the fire, seemingly wearing only a blanket, and she She's surprised when the protagonist starts undressing. After all he's been through, he just wants to warm up a bit. And she says, 
embarrassed that he didn't need to take everything off. Amid his clothes, she sees a photo of the protagonist with a girl in his wallet. Sabrina asks if the girl in the photo is his girlfriend, but the protagonist says she's his ex-girlfriend. She continues to be curious and asks why they broke up. He explains that he wanted a family, but the girl wasn't ready for that, then asks if she had someone before everyone disappeared. Sabrina says yes, her boyfriend was a doctor from MIT and the head of a big company. Howard finds it surprising that such a talented guy had such bad taste in women. This time, she turns irritated. How could he say that about her? He's left speechless, and she realizes she was rude and apologizes. Unaware, the blanket falls, and her breasts are exposed. She yells for the protagonist to leave the room, and he leaves, thinking about the wonderful sight he just had. The next day, the protagonist goes after the deer again, but all he manages to do is see them from afar. Whenever he tries to get closer, they disappear. It's understandable his difficulty. Besides having a short-range weapon, he had never held a real gun in his life. He keeps trying, without success. Days go by and at least Sabrina is talking more with him. She also doesn't complain about him coming back empty-handed from the hunts. The girl is getting weaker every day, and her wound also shows no signs of improvement. Howard tells her that he set up a trap, using stakes and some leaves to lure hungry animals. Sabrina says it was risky because he is already very weak after all this time without eating and, indeed, according to him, this trap will decide whether they survive or not. The next morning, the protagonist goes to check on the trap. Unfortunately, it's empty, but right in the corner, he sees some drops of blood on the stakes and rushes to follow their trail. Running, he begs for the deer to be dead. He desperately needs something to eat. Howard follows the tracks to a clearing and realizes he's too late. The wolves are eating the flesh of the animal that had been caught in the trap. Desperate, he grabs the shotgun and starts firing towards the wolves. Without hitting any, they flee carrying the meat. The protagonist falls to his knees in the snow, even knowing he's in a game. He can't hold back the frustration of having failed and starts screaming in despair. The game is on day 126, and all that's left for the couple to eat is a tomato and a cabbage leaf. Sabrina says it didn't help at all, so he better eat what's left, and he asks her to stop being so proud because they're both going to end up dying anyway. Sabrina looks at him thoughtfully and begins to recount how she lived being controlled before the age of 18. Her father would lock her in the room and dictate everything she had to do. Unlike her siblings, she couldn't go out or have dreams. Because she was a woman, her father said she would one day leave the family just like her mother did and the only way to bring honor was by obeying him. Without the family's power, she was nothing. Now the protagonist understands a bit why she's so proud. Howard says they've all been through tough times and even though they always try their best, they're never rewarded. Maybe it didn't even make sense for him to try so hard. So Sabrina wants to know if he has any skill that makes him stand out. According to him, his skill is never giving up once he's decided to do something. For her, there are many people who work hard, but unless they have something that outshines everyone else, it won't matter. Her strength lies in being independent, and the protagonist will only know his after making an effort to do something. He asks if he'll be recognized by her if he helps her survive. It seems all he wants is to be recognized for doing something. Sabrina says she'll lose her independence if she keeps receiving his help. But since they're going to die anyway, she could be kind to him at least once. She ends up relenting, and he takes the remaining cabbage to eat and staggers out. Before going he says if he doesn't return in three days, she'll find his body near a stream and in that case, she'll know what to do. The girl is left alone in the room, trembling after hearing this. The next day, Howard tells the mannequin about the conversation he had with Sabrina. Now he is willing to do things differently, no longer going to just whine and blame others for his weakness. If he had made this decision earlier, he could have changed things both in real life and in the game. Howard looks at his mannequin friend and pushes his companion off the balcony, symbolizing a new beginning from now on. We see a feminine hand holding a cleaver. The hand belongs to Sabrina, who is standing in front of a body on the ground. It's Howard lying there, and Sabrina is about to slice her companion. She strikes, and suddenly wakes up startled. It was just a dream. This is the first time she's dreamt in three months, meaning, since the beginning of the game, Howard's words have truly weighed on the girl, who is afraid she may have to take drastic measures if she loses her companion. The game is on day 127. Howard throws a shovel into the snow. He's tired and almost out of breath. The protagonist 
was at the lake where he fell before. He remembers that was the only time he managed to approach a deer without being noticed. Probably the water masked his scent, and this time he seems to have a plan to get close to those animals. After that dream, Sabrina is afraid to go back to sleep. Without eating or sleeping, she begins to hallucinate her father. He says she wouldn't go through this if she had followed the path he chose for her. The girl screams at the illusion, and it disappears, at least this time. Sabrina holds a tomato, the only thing she has to eat, and remembers Howard, asking her to acknowledge his hard work, at least once. She promised she would wait for him for three days, and there's only one day left for him to return. Even if he doesn't come back, she is determined to survive. Sometime later, she wakes up again. Now there's a damn rat eating her tomato, she's too weak to get up, and the illusion of her father returns laughing. And her father keeps asking what she will choose, we find out that the boyfriend she claimed to have is, in fact, an old man near death that her father arranged for her to inherit his fortune. Her father says it's shameful she can't endure a little pain, she's just a woman pretending to be strong when she's actually pathetic. In the end, she'll be eaten by rats without being able to do anything. If the illusion is like this, imagine the guy in real life. Back to Howard's plan, a deer appeared and is calmly eating the leaf the protagonist had picked up. In the room, Sabrina aims at her father, she says she doesn't need his help, or anyone's. Her gun is reflected in the rat's eye, and the shotgun in the deer's eyes. After burying himself in the snow to conceal his scent, Howard is very close to shooting the deer. He hits the shot. At the same time, Sabrina also hits the rat squarely. The downed deer lies in the snow, and the protagonist begins to emerge from his hiding spot. With a penetrating gaze, he touches the deer and starts laughing shouting excitedly for having successfully bagged his prey after so much sacrifice. Meanwhile, Sabrina is eating the tomato and roasting the rat she caught, victorious. Howard opens the door, bloodied, carrying the deer, and notices his companion eating. She seems surprised, and the protagonist is exhausted, losing his strength and collapsing. Sabrina gets up to help, and as she tries to lift him, she notices eyes clinging to his clothes. The girl slices the deer and prepares a warm bath for Howard, who remains unconscious. She is worried about his condition when suddenly he grabs her hand and begins whispering her name. Unable to understand, she leans closer and hears him ask if he has earned her recognition. She was about to complain, but she stops and says that he's amazing and that they wouldn't survive without him. The protagonist laughs, finally hearing some kind words from her. He remembers how his ex-girlfriend once told him before they broke up that he was worthless and his hard work was pointless. Poor guy just wanted to be recognized by someone. Sabrina prepares a soup with the deer meat and calls Howard to eat, but he is still very weak, trembling with cold. Feeling obligated to feed him, Sabrina opens his mouth and starts feeding him mouth to mouth, which is quite bizarre. Even with several blankets, Howard continues to shiver with cold, and Sabrina finds herself without alternatives. She resorts to her last resort. The girl begins to undress, stripping completely, then lies down next to the protagonist, embracing him from behind, saying that everything will be okay. Howard wakes up and realizes he's not alone in bed. He turns and sees Sabrina lying next to him. Sabrina asks if he's awake, and he holds her hand, wanting to cherish the moment a little longer, and says he's still not feeling well. She begins to talk about his ex-girlfriend and asks again why they broke up. Howard says she thought they were too young for anything serious, and the girl wants to know about the other reason. Howard thinks for a moment, and says he wanted to have a family. Out of nowhere, Sabrina says she wanted one too leaving him speechless. As she wants to be an independent woman, he doesn't understand this desire to have a family. According to Sabrina, that's precisely why. Wanting to be independent is just a goal she set for herself, and the closer she gets to it, regardless of anything else, the more she becomes trapped in her own choices. She asks how she can claim to be independent if she can't even make a choice on her own, and the protagonist doesn't know how to respond, as he never set goals in life. Now she asks if Howard would like to have a family with her, and this fool is stuck, unable to respond properly. Properly. This leaves her embarrassed, saying she should have thought better before saying something like that. He holds her hand trying to fix the situation, and says he also wants to have a family with her. He just couldn't believe that despite his failures, never being recognized, someone would want to have a family with him. Now they have a reason to survive, and finally, after 130 days, they kiss. The protagonist also manages to do a few things for the first time. Right in the middle, 
Sabrina remembers being gagged by her father and him saying it's time for her to enter the adult world. Her father says this is her final lesson, and a couple enters the room. He instructs them to do it on the couch, and they start undressing. Sabrina is forced to watch as they do what you're thinking. The sicko of her father wants her to watch to learn and do it with the fiancé he arranged for her. The guy reveals he's not even her father, and from now on, he will change her name to Sabrina Luo just to make them appear as father and daughter. Coming out of the memories, Sabrina says she'll have more appreciation for the protagonist from now on, and lies on his chest. He still can't believe what just happened, especially that a woman like her was still a virgin. A month has passed since they became a couple, and it's been a great month for the protagonist. He hasn't fully recovered yet, but he's able to work again. The deer meat ran out, and with the river frozen, they managed to drill holes and go ice fishing. Sabrina started building a greenhouse to grow vegetables, and it's almost ready. Howard hears Sabrina calling, and the girl says she has a present for him, which gets him all excited because he thinks he'll get a kiss from her. Instead, he receives a deerskin poncho, which helps disguise the smell and makes hunting much easier. On the way back, he remembers the night of the typhoon when he found Sabrina clinging to a post, and he never imagined they would become a couple. A lot has changed in his life since the beginning of the game, and he decides to visit the zoo. He starts calling for the tiger, bringing a deer leg for him. Maybe the friend is still around. Howard hears a roar and runs through the snow to find his tiger friend. Exhausted from running so much, the protagonist sees his tiger friend being attacked by the pack. He shouts at the wolves, who look at him and he shoots, trying to drive them away from the tiger. The wolves flee, and the protagonist says it will be okay. Then he realizes the state the tiger is in. It's too late. He's badly injured and won't last long. Howard caresses his head, remembering the happy moments he had with the tiger, and apologizes for being late. If he had arrived a little earlier, he could have saved his friend. The tiger looks at the protagonist, who is about to end the tiger's suffering. He says he'll miss his friend and, swearing revenge, he shoots. The protagonist seems disheartened, even while in the bathtub with Sabrina, and she notices. She asks if something happened, but he doesn't mention the tiger or the wolves, only stating that it's getting colder and more dangerous, and he asks her not to leave the mansion in the coming days. She agrees, mentioning the remaining work to be done in the greenhouse, and asks him to be careful outside, who once pitted himself for lacking love, now that he has achieved what he wanted, refuses to let those wolves take away his happiness. He will do whatever it takes to keep them away from their home. The wolves run through the snow, attempting to catch a deer. Despite the agility of their prey, the wolves hunt in packs and coordinate their efforts to capture prey that cannot escape. After catching the deer, they call out to the rest of the pack, and as they run to eat, Howard, disguised in the deer's poncho for camouflage, shoots and hits one of the wolves, which falls agonizingly into the snow. Without mercy, the protagonist takes a hunting knife and finishes off the wolf. In the middle of the night, the protagonist wakes up, seemingly disturbed by the ongoing conflict with the wolves. Sabrina notices that something is amiss. She remarks that he seems distant and asks if something is wrong. However, fearing that she might find out about the wolves, he simply embraces her, reassuring her that it's nothing important. Although still somewhat suspicious, Sabrina remains silent, while the protagonist contemplates that there are still three wolves left. The next day, the wolves sense a threat and run to hide, and the protagonist is after them again. One of the wolves runs toward a bush and, as it approaches, sees another hidden wolf there. It runs toward the other wolf, and a shotgun barrel enters its mouth and fires. The others become alert after hearing the shot. Emerging from the bushes is Howard, wearing the deer's poncho and the skin of the wolf he had killed the previous day. The protagonist seems determined to annihilate all the wolves mercilessly. The two remaining wolves wolves look at him from afar, surely also seeking revenge for their lost companions. The game reaches day 170, and it has been 10 days since the protagonist began hunting the remaining wolves. He is practicing his aim while thinking that he hasn't found any traces of the remaining wolves. He knows he can't be reckless, or he'll lose to the wolves, but only after eliminating all of them will he be able to have peace again. Howard hears Sabrina calling for him. She says they are going to have fish and roasted meat. Now she seems like a happy housewife with her culinary skills, 
The protagonist tells her that he will be traveling for a few days and won't be eating with her tonight. This guy doesn't know how to appreciate what he has. Sabrina looks at him with pity and says that he's hardly ever home. She asks if Howard is so busy that he can't even have dinner with her. Howard apologizes but says he has to finish some things to be at ease and walks past her. Sabrina, holding back tears, wants to know what could be so important. Since Howard is sure she wouldn't let it go if she knew about the wolves, he insists that it's nothing and leaves Sabrina behind, crying. Three days later, she wakes up to a noise. There are boards outside the window. The noise she heard was Howard nailing them up. She goes outside and asks what he's doing. He says the cold is getting worse so he's reinforcing. Sabrina says she never asked him for protection. Howard thinks she's joking and asks if there's food ready. She starts speaking seriously, saying he's treating her like anybody else instead of his partner. But he's stubborn and says she's wrong, adding that everything he does is to protect the house. Sabrina gets very angry and asks what's really going on, why he doesn't tell her anything. He falls silent and then says she can't help with what he's doing and to stay home. She becomes sad and just leaves quietly, while he plans to go to the hardware store to get nails. He puts on his camouflage clothes, saying the temperature keeps dropping, then drives his car to the store, lamenting fighting with Sabrina. In the store, the protagonist is looking for the tools he needs and happens to find, on a shelf, a diesel generator maintenance manual. He'll be able to use the generator again. Suddenly, the store's TV turns on by itself, catching Howard off guard. AI-63 appears, greeting him. She reminds the protagonist that there's only one week left for the game to end, shocking him. He must have forgotten that this reality had an expiration date. At the mansion, Sabrina sticks a note on the door and leaves with a suitcase, giving one last look before leaving her house, and we see the note she left, saying they both need some time apart, and asking Howard not to follow her. At the tool store, the protagonist broke the TV. He must not have taken the news of the game ending well. When he turns to leave, the wolves appear, and the protagonist says he understands why the wolves are angry with him. The wolves start to approach the protagonist cautiously. Both know the danger they're facing. Feeling cornered, the protagonist runs out of the store, trying to get to his car, but his leg still hurts. He hasn't recovered from when he was buried in the snow. He's caught by the wolves, who knock him down and bite him. The protagonist manages to tear away the deerskin poncho that the wolf was biting and throw it away, then grabs his backpack to fend off the other. With the hunting knife, he manages to strike one of the wolves, but is bitten by the other on the back. He turns to defend himself and hits the wolf's head, but his knife breaks. The wolf seizes the opportunity to bite the protagonist, but receives a kick to the chest. Even with the broken knife, Howard attacks the wolf, which can't get up. With the knife handle, he starts beating the wolf until it stops moving. The protagonist grabs the bag and staggers away while we can see that even though very injured, the wolf is still alive. He remembers desperately asking if that world would continue to exist after the game ended. He wanted to know what would happen to Sabrina, wanted to stay there with her. He completely lost sight of the fact that all of that was just a game. The wolf struggles to stand up and bites Howard's hand. The protagonist says the animal really wants revenge, but that won't happen because he needs to protect Sabrina even if he doesn't end up with her. Meanwhile, Sabrina is driving somewhere. The protagonist tries to get into the car, but he's being attacked by the two wolves. He keeps trying to get in, and Sabrina's gun falls out of the glove compartment. He doesn't know how the gun got there, but at least now he has a chance to defend himself. He shoots and manages to scare off the wolves. The protagonist gets into the car, and the only thing he can think about is fixing the generator. He needs to give Sabrina a chance to survive at all costs. The oil tank is frozen, and Howard can't start it. He's very weak, and the wolves are waiting outside for him. Weak and tired, he passes out. Howard wakes up in a bed with his wounds bandaged. He asks Sabrina how he got home, and she says she found him with the broken car and brought him back. She thought he was dead when she found him. The protagonist wants to know if there was anything around when Sabrina found him, but she only found the bag he was holding. The wolves must have fled before she arrived. Upon hearing about the bag, he remembers the generator and tries to get up, but Sabrina stops him because he's still badly injured. Nevertheless, he doesn't stop and tells her that this is the last thing he needs to do. Sabrina gives in. She knows he won't listen anyway. In the garage, 
Howard focuses on fixing the generator, and his hard work pays off. Now the whole house is illuminated, and he seems proud that he succeeded. The protagonist shouts to Sabrina that they have light now. She is in the kitchen cutting meat, and doesn't seem excited about his accomplishment. Howard goes to the mansion's entrance, and notices a parked car. He wonders if this is the car Sabrina used to bring him back to the mansion. The car is damaged, with the airbag deployed. Something must have happened when Sabrina saved him. The protagonist approaches the car coughing. The wheels seem to be dirty with blood, and Howard finds a wolf's canine stuck in one of the tires. Surely Sabrina dealt with those wolves. Howard stands up and feels dizzy. He bends over, leaning on the car, coughing heavily. When he looks at his hand, he sees he's coughing up blood. He knows that if he doesn't find a doctor, he won't live much longer. Looking at the dent in the car, he imagines Sabrina must have hit a tree. Maybe he didn't realize the girl squashed the wolf with the car against the tree. He takes another look inside the car and then looks towards the mansion. He must have understood what really happened after he passed out. On the clothesline, we see two wolf skins hanging. In the mansion, the protagonist embraces Sabrina, thanking her for everything she did for him, and asks for forgiveness. She doesn't seem angry that he hid the story of the wolves and says she's making a wolf stew. He asks her to make a good dinner because they have a lot to do in bed, especially since the guy is coughing his guts out. The game only has two days left, and the entire city is frozen. Sabrina looks out the window and tells the protagonist that the storm has passed. He doesn't seem well, and she gets worried, asking if he's okay. He really looks awful and says he feels exhausted. Sabrina thinks it might be a cold and looks for medicine for him in a drawer. But the protagonist calls for her, saying it's not just a cold, the guy is dying. His words alarm her, but she tries to be positive, saying he has gone through many hardships since the beginning of the storm. It's a shame that an employee like him isn't recognized. If they were in the company, she would nominate him as the best employee of the quarter. And he thanks, almost powerless, his lovely boss and wife. Sabrina says she hasn't accepted marrying him yet, and hands him a glass of water to take the medicine. Howard is so bad that he can hardly hold the glass. Before Sabrina could help, the glass falls to the floor and breaks. Howard passed out again, and upon opening his eyes, he finds Sabrina lying on top of him. She pulls his sheet and asks him to get up trying to cheer him up, saying she knows he's pretending to be sick just to please her, but this time she won't punish him for it. The protagonist feels terrible and asks her to get up because he wants to talk. Sabrina gets annoyed and asks if he isn't man enough, but actually, she's just sad and doesn't want to admit that he's on his last legs. He tells her that the gas will last for three months and after that, she should head north. He also mentions there are seeds in the warehouse, and for her to learn how to operate the generator with the manual will be easy. He advises her to practice target shooting and to get a cold proof house. Day 180 arrives, and Howard is still alive. He's looking at the city with Sabrina. Sabrina mentions that it has stopped snowing, and the temperature is rising. Once the snow melts, she'll head north to try to find more survivors. Howard asks her if she really loved him. She looks at him deeply and says no. The protagonist thinks, Thankfully, he has no worries then. Sabrina continues, saying he's conceited. Why would she love him? She says he has no qualities, never says anything to cheer her up, always does everything on his own, and never asks for her help. She concludes by calling him an idiot. But from the images, we know she really loved him. Now we see the protagonist lying on the ground with AI-63 near him. She congratulates him for completing the survival challenge. But he looks dazed and says he doesn't remember much. The woman explains that it's normal. The system makes you not remember anything precisely to avoid confusing what's real and what's a dream. And gradually, in a month, he'll remember everything. But he remembers leaving Sabrina in that world and asks what will happen to her there if the dream world will continue to exist. The woman says it was just a game and it's over now and he shouldn't dwell on it because it was just a dream and he has a real life to live. He becomes pensive and since he doesn't remember much, he doesn't have much to say. AI 63 then says it's time to calculate the scores and a screen with information appears. He got a B and earned 50 credits, which she finds reasonable considering the amount of foolishness 
he displayed. She explains that if he had let the person in the game with him die, he would have gotten AD. And if he had managed to get abundant food, shelter, built a transmission network to find other survivors, and even tamed animals, he could have gotten an S. He tells her he's just a normal human, but for her, it doesn't matter because this was a level 0 challenge for new players and the final version arrives in a month. She shows him the next challenge called Frankenstein's Invasion and says these games are to enhance human life. He's not sure if he'll play again because from what he remembers, it was terrible and exhausting. But AI63 says it also had its joys and shows him images of him sleeping with Sabrina. He's shocked seeing the images and says she shouldn't have seen that. But she's a robot so she has no emotions. He asks if Sabrina has these memories, but the robot says it's impossible. He asks how to leave this place, and she explains he just needs to rub his left eye to activate the menu. Before leaving, she says he has a reward, and he asks to deliver it to his workplace, but a dark mist envelopes him, and the robot tells him not to panic because the system is deciding the right reward for him, but he is panicking and afraid when two eyes appear behind him, and it's actually a giant wolf, and he remembers fighting wolves when the wolf prepares to attack him. A giant appears and comes running, throwing a spear from a great distance and hitting the wolf, which falls dead in front of the protagonist. And it seems all this was to illustrate the skill that the protagonist gained, precise throwing. While Howard was still processing everything that happened, suddenly he wakes up to the sound of his alarm clock ringing. He gets up and wonders why he was thrown out of the game since he didn't press the exit button. He touches his eye and nothing happens. The system doesn't respond anymore, and Howard can't tell if he's in a game or in real life. Inside the game, we see AI-63 asking why Howard was forced to exit, and the system responds, Alert! System failures! Memory control function has been deactivated! The woman asks to trace the error code, and the system shows an image from the past when Sabrina was in the game, and had that dream. AI-63 says this is not possible. How could there be a dream within another dream? And asks the system to find a way to fix the flaw. No correction could be found in the database. She becomes disheartened, knowing she'll have to fix the code alone. We see Sabrina in real life. She wakes up with tears in her eyes and has two nurses with her. They ask what happened to Sabrina, and she says she had a dream but can't remember, and asks why the two are in her room. They look at each other, and say that in the early hours Sabrina was sleepwalking, took a knife from the kitchen murmuring something, and then Sabrina remembers Howard. It seems something happened with the system and Sabrina now knows everything. The two nurses suggest Sabrina take a few days off, but she's very shaken, saying it wasn't a dream. In the middle of the city, where traffic and people are everywhere, Howard is disoriented. After spending six months in the dream world, he is now bumping into people because he's not used to seeing so many. He passes by a food cart, and the cook asks if he wants his usual also mentioning a lovely girl and if he wants to be introduced, but he is startled when he sees Howard with his hand in the fire, thinking the dream was so real that even now he still feels the cold. The cook insists on talking about the girl, but Howard says he has a girlfriend now. He arrives at the building where he works and checks his phone to see the time, but fortunately, he's not late. A hand touches his shoulder and when he turns, he sees his friend Donald and excitedly says how long it's been since they've seen each other. But Donald, the mannequin, I mean, Donald, his his friend, says they had dinner together last night. The protagonist apologizes, thinking it's been six months for him. Donald tells him to keep an eye out because they're trying to create a marketing department and that will make them useless in the company. But the protagonist says he doesn't care. He's going to quit himself because the world is wonderful and he has many choices. His friend is amazed at how he changed from one day to the next. At his desk, Howard doesn't know what to do, so he picks up a contact book to start doing something useful. He tears a piece of the paper he was writing on and throws it into the trash. But something strange catches his attention, a different sensation. So he tears another sheet and tries to throw it again into a farther trash basket. He carefully aims and throws, hitting it, and mentions how throwing feels so easy. Then he remembers AI-63 talking about his reward, and how is this possible? He, like me, thought this skill would only work in the game, but he tries again to confirm, this time into an even farther trash basket. But his boss shows up right when he throws, and the paper ball hits him in the bulldog-like face. Everyone is shocked at what Howard did. His boss tells him to come to his office, and as he goes, 
several colleagues start talking bad about him behind his back. Only Donald looks worried. In the boss's office, they start talking, and the boss says he shouldn't have underestimated Howard. The protagonist is taken aback, but starts talking about being fired today and wanting to receive what's due. But the boss asks if he wants to leave like this, if he's forgetting something. Howard thinks he found out he talks badly about him online. But the boss is actually ecstatic and says he forgot to congratulate him for everything he taught Howard. He says the company's vice president will lead the new department and ask to have Howard on the team. That's why the boss is so friendly with the protagonist now. If he doesn't treat Howard well, he'll be out on the street. The tables have turned, folks. Donald is surprised at how the protagonist was transferred like this. While they're talking, the boss's brown nose comes to confront Howard, asking why Howard was called and he, as team leader, wasn't. But the boss's shadow appears, shouting at him to shut up, and he's also with the vice president introducing Mr. Liu. He asks if the guy doubts his ability to select employees. The brown nose apologizes and says he didn't mean that. The boss calls him a pig and says he won't be the team leader anymore. From now on, Donald will be, who promises to do a good job. Look at the idiotic face the brown nose makes. The boss also says Howard doesn't need to work today. He should pack up for the new job. Howard doesn't understand why he's being so flattered. The vice president also takes the opportunity to announce that there will be a party for the new department, and he should attend, also telling all employees that there won't be any layoffs and they should work properly. And as Mr. Liu is leaving, it's finally revealed in his thoughts that all this was asked by Sabrina. Donald is trying to manage his team, but no one is interested in what he's saying, and they say just because he's the leader now doesn't mean they'll work more or just because he's saying. Outside the building, Howard is talking to his mother, saying that with the raise he'll be able to pay off the family's debt. He's interrupted by a beautiful woman, saying she's the leader of the new department team he'll be a part of. Her name is Sandy. Howard greets her, and when she mentions where the party will be, he thinks it's at the mansion where he lived with Sabrina, so she suggests they go together. As they walk, they hear someone screaming. It's people chasing a thief. Howard takes Sandy's bag and prepares to throw it, even though it's very far away. He hits the thief right right in the leg as he jumps, causing him to fall face first onto the ground. While the victims hold the thief down, Howard picks up the papers that fell from the bag. He's worried that Sandy might not have liked him touching her bag, but she's all excited, saying he's amazing that he hit the thief from afar, and if he can teach her to do that. As Howard gathers her things, he finds a card label, Lawrence Enterprises, and Sandy explains that they're a business partner of their company, and that this Lawrence owns a company that's in the top 100 largest companies in the world. Howard says that name sounds familiar, and Sandy jokes about Sabrina dating the old man. Then he asks Sandy to hurry up, or they'll be late for the party, and says there's no point in him thinking about Sabrina because what happened in the game doesn't apply to real life. They arrive at the mansion, and Sandy starts asking a friend for directions to the party, but Howard just goes in because he knows the mansion like no one else. They arrive at the party, and Sandy's friends ask why she took so long, but she's impressed with Howard. In the middle of the party, Sabrina is with Mr. Lou. He says now that every everyone's here, the party will begin. Sandy immediately hugs the protagonist, saying they'll sit together at a table, and Sabrina clearly looks uncomfortable. Mr. Liu begins a speech about how the company will conduct itself from now on, and Sandy explains that Sabrina is more powerful than Mr. Liu because she's the owner's daughter. Howard questions how Mr. Liu is the vice president being so young, and Sandy explains that he's been close to Sabrina since they were kids, and he was a prodigy at a prestigious university. Mr. Liu says the boring part is over, and now it's time for music and dinner. He invites Sabrina to dance, and she accepts, saying the last time they danced was in high school. Now it's Howard who feels uncomfortable. What a situation guys, it must be tough for both of them. Dinner arrives, and Sandy says this steak must be worth their salary. They toast while he watches Sabrina dance, and Sabrina also sneaks a glance at him while dancing. Howard overhears some guests commenting that Sabrina and Mr. Lou would make a beautiful couple, besides being childhood friends, and the protagonist thinks that Sabrina could be happy with this guy. While pondering this, Howard gets distracted and burns his hand on the hot steak. Sandy gets up and pours cold water on the protagonist's hand. She says the burn isn't serious, and Howard feels embarrassed with her so close. Partygoers start commenting on the two of them being a couple, and Sabrina also hears the comments. She looks in their direction with a sad expression, and even Lou notices that she's upset. Suddenly, a guy appears saying that Sabrina is having fun. He wants to know why Sabrina, who is engaged to Lawrence, is dancing with another guy. Howard asks Sandy who the guy is, and she says his name is Hans, and he works at Lawrence's company. The protagonist tries to disguise when he hears Sabrina's fiancé's name, as if he had no 
idea who he is. Lou explains to Hans that he was dancing with Sabrina to liven up the party, and Sabrina thanks Hans for coming but says it's an internal company gathering. As she speaks, the guy stares at her cleavage, and Sabrina asks him to leave. He pays no attention and invites himself to the party, also inviting Sabrina to dance with him. Lou tries to push the guy away, saying they're not even close enough to dance, but Hans says it's not Lou's job to say such things. At the table, Sandy notices that the atmosphere isn't good, and they might end up arguing if it continues. To avoid further discussions, Sabrina agrees to dance with Hans. In the middle of the dance, he says he'll be responsible for taking the girl to her fiancé since it's a long-distance relationship. She thanks him, and Hans shamelessly starts getting closer to her body. Sabrina stops dancing and tells Hans not to touch her like that. He agrees, but internally thinks of her as just another girl. Sandy comments that Mr. Lou must be hating to see Sabrina going through this but can't do anything because he has much less power than Lawrence. The protagonist watches as Hans begins to grope Sabrina, until she holds his hand and says they'd better stop dancing. Even Sandy, who is just watching, feels embarrassed by Hans's behavior but he doesn't stop. He purposely steps on Sabrina's dress, causing her to lose her balance, and the strap of her dress tears. Mr. Lou gets angry but does nothing out of fear of Lawrence, and it seems like Howard is going to take action. The sun is setting, and out of nowhere, a steak comes flying. The piece of meat hits Hans right in the eyes, and he starts screaming that his eyes are burning, while Sabrina holds her dress to avoid exposing her breasts. The party guests notice what happened to Sabrina but don't pay attention to Hans, who becomes even more irritated. The guy orders his assistants to find out who threw the steak at him. One of them goes to Howard's table, takes a look at the dishes on the table but finds nothing suspicious, as he sees two steaks there. The protagonist becomes apprehensive with the guy so close to him and thanks Sandy right after throwing it. He was lucky that Sandy put half of her steak on his plate. She says you're welcome and thinks the protagonist was very bold to do that. Hans's assistants return saying they didn't find who threw the steak. The guy doesn't accept the explanation, shouting that nobody will leave until he finds out who did it, until he gets slapped in the face. The slap is so strong that it knocks Hans to the ground. After slapping him, Sabrina orders him and his colleagues to disappear from there. Her firm attitude surprises all the guests. Even Howard is startled and thinks he was lucky not to get hit by her in the game. Hans keeps saying that Sabrina dared to hit him, and behind Sabrina, Lou becomes brave and says that if Hans doesn't leave, he will call the police on him. Not even with the threat does Hans back down, so one of his employees says something in his ear, and this time Hans decides decides to leave the party. Lou asks Sabrina why Hans suddenly changed his mind, and she is just relieved that they left and will change clothes. Howard watches from afar as Sabrina leaves the party, and Sandy is staring at Howard from the other side of the table. He thinks they've already ordered too many drinks, and it's better to leave, but Sandy has other plans since she found the protagonist more charming than Lou. In fact, Howard is not worried about how much they have drunk but rather about his bank account. He only has a few dollars left, and it's still a week until he gets paid. Since Sandy has no idea about this, she doesn't want to stop drinking, saying that for every three glasses as she drinks. Howard has to take one. The idea seems good to the protagonist because that way he can make her drink more and eat less. Some time later, Sandy falls asleep from drinking too much, and Howard tries to wake her up, asking her where she lives. She wakes up and starts saying some nonsensical things, dancing, but she's still very drunk and falls on top of Howard. The protagonist asks her to get off him because there are people watching, but the girl starts hitting on him. Before she could go any further, the waiter brings the bill. When the protagonist the protagonist looks at the amount, he realizes he will be penniless until payday. He could have thought about splitting this bill. Now, the two are climbing the stairs of a building. Howard is taking Sandy to his apartment, and the girl says he's a jerk for doing this on their first date. But since she doesn't say where she lives and Howard doesn't have money to pay for a hotel, this is the only solution. A guy passes behind them and looks at them, very suspicious. The protagonist puts Sandy to bed, and she asks to be hugged. But Howard backs away, telling her to sleep. 
He doesn't want to be the subject of office gossip. Sandy knows she hasn't recovered yet, but she hasn't given up on the protagonist yet. She manages to get up a bit, and Howard asks her what she wants, and Sandy throws herself at him. She wants to conquer the protagonist before she falls asleep. Even though he likes what he sees, he holds Sandy's hand and says it will be a disaster if they go all the way. The girl doesn't listen and continues to approach. If it continues like this, Howard won't be able to control himself, but she stops. And when he looks at her, the protagonist sees that Sandy has fallen asleep. She belches in his face, and the smell is so strong that Howard sobers up. He puts Sandy back in bed once again and goes to sleep on the couch. Someone opens the apartment door, and Howard wakes up with light shining on his face. He gets up and sees that a guy has entered his apartment. The guy goes straight to the room where Sandy is sleeping and stares at her. Howard appears in the bedroom door, asking the guy what he's doing and how he got in there. The guy tells the protagonist to speak lower and says it's his turn to have fun with the girl. Howard is shocked by the response and grabs the guy, telling him to leave the apartment, but the guy retaliates and throws the protagonist to the ground. The guy focuses on Sandy again and says he owes the protagonist a favor. Since they're both men, he thinks the protagonist will understand him. There's something wrong with this guy. And of course, Howard doesn't understand the guy. He grabs a chair and uses it to attack the intruder, but the guy manages to break the chair with one punch, effortlessly. The guy says, convinced, that people would do anything for a favor from him. Knowing he can't beat him in a fight, Howard decides to call the police. And the guy thinks it's unnecessary. After everything the guy did, it's more than necessary for the protagonist to call the police. And seeing him pick up his phone, the guy panics and tries to take Howard's phone. He thought the girl was there to work. And after understanding that wasn't the case, he's shocked to know people do such things on the first date. Now, the guy tries to explain that he's been away for 20 years and has no idea how people behave nowadays. But if that's the case, Howard wants to know why the guy stayed at his door instead of going home. The guy explains that he used to live in that apartment before the protagonist and came back to get some things he hid. He starts walking around the apartment and removes a piece of the floor. He takes out a box that was hidden and shows that inside it there were several jewels. This doesn't matter much to the protagonist who wants to know how the guy will compensate for what he did, but the guy thinks it was all just a misunderstanding. He introduces himself as Josh, says he's not a good person, and he's leaving. The protagonist still thinks it's better to call the police, but Josh says it's better not to provoke him. Josh hands a box to the protagonist, and Howard thinks he's being bribed, but according to the guy, it's just an iron ring that isn't worth much. According to Josh, since he took the ring, he had been dreaming of a woman. She wore a red coat, held a golden scepter, and had eyes that shone in blue. He even tried to approach her but ended up being beaten by her. The protagonist thinks that, by the description, she looks a lot like AI-63. The guy leaves, and Howard stares at the box. Before Josh leaves, Howard asks if the guy really thinks that's a bribe, but he doesn't say anything and leaves. The protagonist wonders if that box could have any relation to the game, and when he opens it, he sees a ring with a red stone inside it. The stone seems to have made some connection with the system through Howard's eye, and a light emanates from the box. A hologram very similar to AI-63 appears and claims to be the developer of the dream system, bringing a warning message for whoever tests the system. The hologram states that the person person has fallen into a trap, leaving Howard shocked upon hearing this. It continues, saying that the game can make the person confuse what is real and socially acceptable. Their mentality changes without them noticing, and when they return to reality, they cannot differentiate between what is real and the game, often committing obscure acts. Despite the developer's protests, the game's financiers like this. The hologram urges the person to be attentive to the changes and not to be swayed by impulses, mentioning that she left communication devices scattered throughout the game's challenges to help the user escape the system, and asks the protagonist to come to her. The message ends, and the protagonist thinks that the developer resembles AI-63, but he doesn't think he would do anything out of the ordinary. He wonders if Josh met AI-63 20 years ago, and he only learned about the game after moving into the apartment. Perhaps the ring has some connection to the system. The protagonist continues holding the box when his phone rings. He stayed up all night, and now has to to work again. Sandy also wakes up due to the noise, and by the way she's dressed, 
She definitely thinks something happened between her and the protagonist during the night. They both go to buy breakfast at the stall together. The owner is happy for Howard to have someone and doesn't even charge for the purchase. Howard doesn't seem thrilled about the relationship while Sandy clings to him. The protagonist wonders why this is happening to him. This guy doesn't know how to be happy. Arriving at the company, people look at the new couple and comment that the former group leader had his eye on Sandy. And it's strange that she ended up with Howard, who was a stranger. He overhears and isn't happy to hear this. The couple enters the elevator, and Sandy is planning what they will do after work, but the protagonist thinks he doesn't have money and will have to borrow from Donald. Sandy also suggests they stop at a pharmacy to buy some things, and just then, the elevator opens, and Howard freezes upon seeing who is entering. Sabrina appears at the elevator door and greets the two as she enters. Howard is embarrassed by the situation, and Sabrina remarks that the two have progressed quickly in their relationship. Sandy expresses regret that Sabrina overheard about them and says they are embarrassed, but Sabrina continues to express surprise at how fast Howard is moving, leaving him speechless. Sandy keeps talking, mentioning she made it easy for Howard, thinking he was a gentleman. Howard covers her mouth before she goes into details, but the gesture only makes Sabrina think the two are very close. Sabrina congratulates them before leaving the elevator, asking them to act professionally in the office. When Sabrina exits the elevator, she appears very sad. It must have been difficult for her to wish happiness to the couple. Inside the elevator, Sandy criticizes Sabrina for asking them to act discreetly at work, and Howard also thinks it's better for them to be professional while working. Sandy lets go of Howard's arm and starts throwing a tantrum, saying he's not supporting her. She wants unconditional support, and asks if the protagonist has ever thought about starting a family with her. Talking about family makes him think, and Howard decides he should prioritize his relationship with Sandy. Sandy hugs Howard and says she'll wait for him after work. Before leaving, she mentions that that the protagonist could be a bit more aggressive. In Sabrina's office, Mr. Lou remarks that she's overexerting herself, as she doesn't even have time for lunch. According to Sabrina, she's too busy with the new department, but for Mr. Lou, who knows her well, this is just an excuse because she's anxious. He leans on Sabrina's desk and asks if Howard is the reason she's feeling this way. Sabrina is shocked but denies knowing what he's talking about. Mr. Lou looks back, and Howard is entering the room. He mentions he has finished a task and Mr. Lou asks the protagonist to show his work. Facing Howard, Sabrina tries to avoid eye contact. Mr. Lou evaluates Howard's work, and neither the protagonist nor Sabrina can look at each other. Sensing this, Mr. Lou asks what Howard is thinking about, and the protagonist explains that he was looking at a plant, examining the seedling on Sabrina's desk. His heart races as he asks if it's a tomato plant in the pot. Sabrina's hands tremble. She looks at Howard after hearing the question and says he seems to know about tomato plants. The protagonist claims he knows these plants well, while recalling Sabrina growing tomatoes in the game. She appears moved and asks if he has seen these plants somewhere before. He says he has, and his heart tightens as he remembers AI 63's warning that everything he experienced was a game, the developer's warnings, and his new girlfriend. He recalls Sabrina smiling at him in the game, but ultimately lies that he saw tomato plants in his hometown. Mr. Lou asks why Sabrina is growing tomatoes in the office, and Sabrina seems disappointed, but quickly changes her expression and says she must have planted the wrong seeds. In the bathroom, Howard washes his face, trying to stop thinking about Sabrina. He still can't separate Sabrina from her game counterpart in reality. In her office, Sabrina is relieved to have disguised that she remembers the protagonist. Still in the bathroom, Howard realizes he has already fallen into the game's trap and focuses on getting Sabrina out of his head. Holding the tomato plant, Sabrina also decides she needs to forget about what she experienced with Howard. From now on, they will live as if they don't know each other. Donald lends money to Howard, saying that now his friend's expenses have increased. At the end of the day, Sandy is waiting for Howard. He has decided to take his girlfriend out to dinner and make her happy, but when he steps out, he sees her talking to the former team leader. The guy claims to be concerned about her, and the protagonist joins the conversation, wanting to know what's going on. Howard asks if she's okay, and the other guy says that, unlike the protagonist, he's honest and leaves after saying 
saying what he wanted to her. The protagonist tells Sandy to ignore the guy, but she seems shaken by what he said. She lets go of Howard's hand and says she wants to break up with him. Sandy explains that they don't know each other well and asks about the value of his family's debt. The protagonist calmly says it's 200,000 and Sandy panics. The debt is much larger than she had imagined. She thinks it's best for them to go their separate ways. Sandy isn't from a wealthy family and assumes she realized the protagonist wasn't really interested in her. She only wanted to be with him because she hated how Sabrina always attracted guys. Sandy confesses that she doesn't deserve such a good guy and asks him to forget about the previous night. Howard thinks it's not the first time a girl has left him. His first love also left him for the same reason. On his way home, he's embarrassed by his debts and doesn't know how he's going to pay off everything he owes. When he opens the door to his apartment, the protagonist realizes something is wrong. There's a pot on the stove, and Josh is on his couch, all beaten up. After the day he's had, Howard loses control and grabs Josh by the neck. He can't stand the guy invading his home and using his things. Josh begs to stay at the house for a few days. He has nowhere else to go and was beaten up when he tried to get a job. But the protagonist has no pity and kicks him out. Alone at home, Howard goes to see what the guy was cooking. When he opens the pot, there are some mushrooms floating in a strange broth that doesn't seem edible. The protagonist tells the homeless man to come back inside, and Josh is apprehensive about the change of heart. Howard says Josh's food was incredible. It's as if he had eaten something prepared by a chef, and the guy says he knows how to make some dishes. Now, the protagonist wants to know how the guy couldn't get a job and still got beaten up even though he's so talented. Josh explains that he's an ex-convict. He doesn't know how to deal with technology or make a decent resume. So Howard invites Josh to open a restaurant, and the guy agrees if the protagonist doesn't mind his criminal record. Howard gets up, saying he'll look for a place to rent, but Josh asks if he's sure because his criminal record is pretty bad. That doesn't seem to matter to the protagonist. He'll do anything to see his family standing tall again, even if it means trusting someone like Josh. The protagonist asks for some of the money Josh had hidden in the apartment to rent a place, but the guy spent everything he had on his girlfriends, ruining Howard's idea of having some money to start the business. Howard's phone rings, and he's surprised to see it's Sandy calling him. She says she's not a gold digger, and he wants to know why she's calling him. Sandy says she found a quick way to make money and asks if he's interested. Of course, he's more than interested. In Sabrina's office, Mr. Lou begins to comment on Howard. He is pleased that the protagonist managed to finish a week's work in just one day and produce quality work. He reveals that he thought Sabrina was having an affair with Howard but now understands that she just wanted to keep the good employees she had in the department. Sabrina forces a smile and says that her friend is not a saint and should change his secretary. Speaking of her, the girl appears, calling for Mr. Liu. Looking at the secretary, Sabrina remembers her father using this employee to teach spicy things to his daughter. Mr. Liu tells Sabrina that they have already agreed not to talk about each other's personal lives and leaves. The protagonist feels like an idiot for believing Sandy's idea. The girl introduces two friends, explaining that the three of them do live streams of a different kind from the conventional. Just by looking at how they are dressed, the protagonist notices that there is something strange and asks why they are dressed like that. They dress like this to attract more attention and thus attract more viewers, which means more money. One of the girls, Flatty, explains that the protagonist will have to wear the clothes they prepared for him and throw darts. Sandy offers Howard half of what they earn tonight. It seems that it will depend on the protagonist whether the live stream will catch the public's attention or not. Desperate to earn some extra money, the protagonist is willing to do anything. Flatty wants to know why Sandy called Howard to participate. It seems that, given the kind of things they do, this won't be very exciting. Sandy says it would be good to do something new, and the other girl begins to complain that Sandy is not the owner of the channel to decide things alone. She thinks it's better for them to do something more thrilling with Howard. The three look when the protagonist finishes dressing. He is wearing some very exotic clothes. It seems that the content they produce is indeed quite different. Flatty thinks the outfit looks perfect on the protagonist, just didn't like the mask much. Chubby believes Howard covered his face out of embarrassment for wearing such clothes. Clearly, he wouldn't want to be recognized dressed like that. Sandy explains to the protagonist that there's been a change of plans. They're going to add an electric mesh to the show. 
It seems Howard's reactions to the shocks will draw attention. Sandy tries to reassure the protagonist that it's safe, and Howard is determined to endure this embarrassment for money. The girls start the live stream, introducing a new challenge, shooting darts at an electrified coating. If the protagonist misses the target, he'll get a shock, and to demonstrate the intensity, Chubby throws a piece of meat on the floor, which gets toasted when it hits the net, definitely not safe. Finally, she introduces who will take on the challenge, the protagonist, looking very unhappy in his leather outfit. Chubby says the protagonist will throw 10 darts and asks the audience to send virtual gifts to support him. As the girls watch the viewer count rise, Sandy tries to lower the voltage of the net, worried about the protagonist. But Chubby holds Sandy's hand, making her angry because she doesn't want to lie to the audience. This girl doesn't care at all about Howard's safety. Sandy says Howard could get hurt, but Chubby starts yelling on the live stream that people risk their lives every day, and she won't deceive their viewers. She says the protagonist also has to make an effort. If he's going to be a hindrance, he should leave. Howard then raises a dart ready to throw, narrowly missing Chubby's head, it could have hit her face. He hits the target on the first try and asks if that's enough. Chubby is surprised and decides to increase the challenge. Sandy protests that Howard is already far from the target, but her friend doesn't care. She just wants to increase the audience. The protagonist continues hitting the target, even from a greater distance, managing to hit seven darts on target. This significantly boosts followers and views until the protagonist approaches the studio door and throws the remaining darts on the ground, telling the camera he doesn't like acting and that many people were only watching because they thought he would fail. The girls are shocked by what he said, and the protagonist says this may have been his first and last live stream and leaves the room. The girls complain that they worked hard, and the live stream ended like this, but it was the protagonist who did all the work. Suddenly, something shocking happens on their channel. The next day, they call Howard and tell him he's gone viral. Howard thinks it's all nonsense. He doesn't want to be popular with people seeing funny pictures of him. The protagonist is surprised when he leaves his room. Josh has prepared a full breakfast for him, already planning the restaurant's menu. The protagonist says he doesn't like the look of those dishes much. Also, there's no rush because it will take some time to open the restaurant. Howard just needs to raise the necessary money. And in the meantime, Josh can stay at his house. Howard arrives at the company, and Sandy and the girls are waiting for him at the door. They try to talk to the protagonist, but he says he has to work and avoids them. He's decided not to meet with them anymore. In the office, a colleague says Mr. Lu wants to talk to Howard, and the protagonist realizes his colleagues are watching videos. The guy says he's watching Brother Seven, who is so popular that even Mr. Lu liked him. Brother Seven is none other than the protagonist in costume, and Howard asks if the character wasn't called Slanty. It seems that since he hit seven darts, he's been called Brother Seven. Howard goes to Mr. Lu's office and is pressured by the boss. Mr. Lu knows the protagonist and Sandy were on the live stream and wants to know why they didn't show up. It seems Mr. Lu found Brother Seven very charming. Mr. Lu wants Brother Seven's contact and says the character dresses well and is admired by people. Mr. Lu wants Howard to get Brother Seven's contact at all costs. He has plans to make money with the character and also offers Howard a new position with a much better salary. Since he still needs money, the protagonist agrees to Mr. Lu's request. The girls are waiting to meet with the protagonist, who is late, until Sandy says he's arrived, and Chubby runs toward Howard, telling him that she used to make fitness videos, but no one paid attention until she made herself look ugly and did silly things. She begs not to be humiliated making videos anymore, just to earn a decent living, and the protagonist holds her hand, willing to continue making videos with them. After a month, the system notifies that the next dream will begin in a day. But he's no longer eager for the dream world. Now, he also finds the real world fun. The protagonist continues to make his presentations, and Sandy also appears to cheer up the viewers. Howard throws pies in the audience's faces, which pleases them, and they get excited shouting the protagonist's name. Sabrina is the only one who doesn't like the presentation, even though Mr. Lee says they'll make a lot of money from it. Chubby introduces the protagonist's show, and Mr. Lee gets excited to participate. The only one not convinced of the protagonist's popularity is Sabrina. After the presentation, Mr. Lee comments that Howard has disappeared, and the protagonist, disguised, 
reveals that he prefers not to work for Sabrina's company. This disappoints Mr. Liu, and before he could say anything, an old acquaintance returns. Hans appears, saying that his company would be a much better choice, but the protagonist also rejects the offer. Unconvinced, Hans offers five times more than Mr. Liu had offered. To Sabrina, this is a typical tactic of someone like Hans. The protagonist explains that he will decline the offer because he hates Hans, leaving him speechless. After this, Sabrina thinks that the protagonist is better than she thought. Josh is surprised that the protagonist managed to get money to start their business so quickly. In fact, part of that money was saved by Howard's parents, despite their large debt, and that money means a lot to the protagonist. Josh reveals that he won't be starting the business with Howard anymore, leaving Howard puzzled. His colleague explains that he found another job and it's better for Howard to keep the money. The protagonist's former colleague reveals to Hans that it's Howard who's been doing the presentations in disguise. Hans talks to his colleague about someone he knows who recently got out of prison, and the guy says that if they give money to this person, he'll do whatever they ask in return. Looking at a photo of the protagonist, Hans is planning his revenge. The protagonist appears injured and sinking, wondering if this is how he's going to die. Just a few hours ago, he was whole, and an unfamiliar woman was knocking on his door. The protagonist meets with Mr. Liu and talks about his roommate. Mr. Liu says that soon Howard won't need to share the room anymore since he's getting a raise and introduces his driver and secretary, both familiar to Sabrina's memories. The protagonist asks where they're going, and according to Mr. Lee, they are meeting a powerful woman. The woman appears and disagrees with something, leaving Sabrina and her team disappointed. Howard and Mr. Lee arrive, and Sabrina asks why the protagonist came to a business meeting. Mr. Lee explains that Howard is now his assistant, and will introduce him to Mrs. Sharon, the CEO of a large company. The protagonist tries to introduce himself, but the woman pays him no attention. From what Mr. Lee says, she's always like this. Her company is the largest in the country, and they need to form a partnership, or else they won't be able to increase the company's profits. If that happens, Sabrina will lose a bet she made with headquarters, and he'll never see her again. The protagonist remembers Sabrina talking about her goals in the game, and wonders why Mr. Liu said he wouldn't see Sabrina again if she lost the bet. Mr. Liu wants to try another meeting with Sharon. She holds grudges against Sabrina's father, so the young woman thinks it's useless to try again, believing that there are only three days left until the end of the bet. Sharon's company is the only solution Mr. Liu can think of. As if things weren't bad enough, Hans appears, saying he will take Sabrina to Lawrence's house. Mr. Liu intervenes, saying that Sabrina hasn't lost the bet yet, but Hans insists that Sabrina must meet Lawrence to get married as soon as possible to accelerate the cooperation between the companies. The girl is disappointed but agrees to go with him. Watching this, Howard thinks that the marriage is just a form of negotiation. Mr. Liu doesn't think Sabrina's father would agree to this, but according to Hans, this is the only way to save the company. Putting everything together, the protagonist concludes that Sabrina must have bet her performance at work and if she didn't reach the goal, she would have to marry Lawrence, the super rich guy who might even be in another country. Sabrina asks Mr. Liu to stop arguing because she knows how her father operates, always manipulating and deciding her future. Mr. Liu asks the protagonist to go back home and leaves with Sabrina, while Hans laughs, saying she deserves to lose the bet. Howard's phone rings and Flatty says that haters have started spreading rumors that their show is a cult. But for now, there's nothing they can do. It's obvious who did this, and Hans makes a point of saying it's just the beginning, revealing that he knows about the protagonist's disguise. By the poolside, Howard has no idea what Hans intends to do, and thinking about Sabrina's situation, he decides to talk to Sharon again. Then, a man approaches him. It's Josh who says he was paid to kill a man and apologizes to the protagonist, who falls into the pool injured, wondering if he will die. Sharon reaches out to help him. The game says the character was created, and the protagonist wakes up greeted by AI-63 to start the Frankenstein Invasion Challenge. He asks if he's still alive, and according to AI-63, the dead don't enter the game, so he asks if his life was in danger. Reflecting on what happened, Howard remembers Josh saying it wasn't a fatal wound but that he needed to get to a hospital quickly. If he didn't disappear, both he and the people around him would end up in graves, and the protagonist wonders why everything has to be so hard for him. 
With no choice, he decides to face the game. Before going, AI-63 warns that it's better to take some tools or he'll die quickly, but he ignores it. This time, he will train intensely to become a better fighter. Starting the Frankenstein Invasion Challenge, he is in the role of a surviving warrior who needs to fight and explore, and has 180 days before destruction. With a bulletproof vest and a gun, the protagonist believes the challenge shouldn't be so difficult. A liquid splashes on his helmet, and as he looks for its source, he sees a giant gorilla devouring another soldier. Running for his life, he will have to fight against this type of monster this time. The protagonist enters a ruin to take cover and considers whether he should use his gun against the monster, which is coming toward him. Instead of the gun, the protagonist grabs a piece of iron and hits the ceiling with it, causing part of the structure to collapse on the gorilla. Under the rubble, Howard manages to hit the monster's eye with the iron tip. The gorilla screams in pain and runs away. The protagonist survived the first attack and emerges from the debris, thinking that he must be more careful from now on. He senses a presence and grabs another piece of iron to attack the new enemy, but it turns out to be CO Sharon in front of him. The protagonist can't stop the attack and throws the iron, which luckily only hits her helmet. Howard asks if she's okay, and Sharon says the protagonist should be in the hospital. He doesn't understand what she means. Sharon explains that Howard broke into her room injured and then fell into the pool, so she called an ambulance. The protagonist thinks he must have gone to her room to ask for help, but at no point did the game start. He mentions waking up in the middle of the ruins and asks how she ended up there. Sharon doesn't know either. They both just appeared, like the protagonist did. He thanks her for saving him by calling the ambulance and concludes that there's something wrong with this game. Sharon asks him to save those words for another time and, since he's good at throwing things, he should be able to help her. The protagonist is confused by her request, and she shows him a distant city in ruins, asking if it looks familiar. Looking closely, Howard is surprised, realizing it's the ruin of the building where he works. Judging by the state of the building and others around it, Sharon says they must have traveled between 300 and 400 years in time. The water around them also looks caustic, and the sea level keeps rising. The protagonist understands that the world is ending. To Sharon, they aren't the only surviving humans, and she might find a habitable place. The only problem is the monsters, but if Howard works with her, she can lead while he takes care of their security. The protagonist asks if she's not afraid, considering that she's making plans after realizing they time traveled. Sharon tells him that survival is the only goal in this world. Walking in the middle of a desert, Sharon asks if Howard was a dart-throwing athlete, but he says it was just a hobby. He didn't expect her to remember his name, since she didn't pay attention when they first greeted each other. At that moment, he had no value to Sharon. After climbing a hill, the protagonist agrees that she's a good leader. They spot a kind of fortress, and Sharon says that one can only have friends after valuing oneself. Suddenly, the protagonist covers her mouth, and they hide in a ravine. Above them, a giant centipede is passing by. Howard grabs his gun and offers it to Sharon in case she needs to defend herself. She thanks him and says she'll help him if they're in danger. They reach the fortress after the protagonist makes sure there are no monsters nearby. The place is very clean, but it's strange that they haven't seen any humans, until Howard finds something that surprises him, a kind of military fortress. Sharon notices what appears to be an eagle's nest on top, although a nest shouldn't be that large. She barely finishes speaking when the protagonist tells her to move away. A giant, radioactive-looking eagle is attacking. Sharon tells the protagonist to hide, but he doesn't take a single step, only telling her to protect herself. She thinks he's crazy. There's no way he can kill a monster like that with pieces of iron, but that's exactly what he's planning. The protagonist remembers when Josh held a knife to his neck and he did nothing to defend himself, only listening to Josh talk about how easily he could be destroyed and how, even if he wanted to, Howard wouldn't be his boss. When this dream ends, the protagonist wants to remember at least how fearless and brave he can be. The eagle approaches, and Howard is ready to throw his iron darts. He starts throwing them one after another, and they all hit the winged monster precisely. Sharon watches the protagonist's feet in surprise, and the monster falls defeated to the ground. As the monster falls, a green liquid hits Howard, who screams in pain as if he's being burned. Sharon runs towards him, telling him not to touch the caustic liquid. When she gets close, it seems to be too late, 
Smoke is coming out of the protagonist's wounds, and he continues screaming in pain. Suddenly, the fortress makes a noise, and a robot emerges from it, saying it detected an injured human and activates its medical system. A needle appears on the robot's arm, and it injects it into the protagonist's back, who seems to be receiving an electric shock. With this, the robot runs out of energy and shuts down, and the protagonist also faints. Some time later, the protagonist wakes up with strange hair and asks where they are. Sharon explains that they are in the fortress, and thanks to the robot's medication, his wounds have been healed. She plugged the robot into the socket, and hopes it can tell them about the place when it wakes up. The robot wakes up, alerting that there's a large, dirty area, and rushes to clean it up. It approaches the monster's remains and sets fire to the carcass. Sharon says the robot must have advanced technology, and there must be a code to activate it. She remembers the numbers written on its body and calls the robot. 2003. When called, it stops autopilot and activates the smart program. From what it says, this robot has collected tons of garbage and has been attacked by hundreds of creatures. A blue light turns on in the robot, replacing the red one, and it says that humans left it behind because it didn't work hard enough. If it continues cleaning everything, humans will return one day. Sharon asks if the place is tidy because the robot cleans every day, and according to him, humans will come back when they know how clean the place is. His response leaves them both uneasy, and Sharon wants to know if the humans said where they were going. The robot explains that the humans said if they didn't return in a year, they had probably gone to paradise, which sounds like a good place to him. The poor robot even wanted to go to them but couldn't find paradise on the map and asks if they know where that place is. The protagonist thinks it's better for the robot not to know, and by now, those humans are probably dead. Sharon changes plans after learning there are no more humans and asks the robot to take her to the storage room. Watching how she adapts her plans, Howard thinks the girl is truly unshakable. In the warehouse, there are weapons but no ammunition, compressed energy bars, and a medicine called Medusa's Tears, used to heal wounds but harmful if used excessively. The protagonist is worried because that's what the robot used to heal him, but the robot explains he'll be fine. The only effect is that his hair grew. However, the medicine can't completely fix the nervous system, and humans who used too much ended up in a vegetative state. There's also a reservoir and a power supply center. Sharon asks why the robot didn't recharge if there was power, but he couldn't use those resources without permission. She says machines will always be machines and asks the robot to show the rest of the place. The girl can't understand the language people were using, and the robot arrives with a map for her. On the way, his wheel breaks, and he falls to the ground, needing good maintenance. Sharon doesn't try to help, she just asks if he can read what was written. The robot says humans use scribbles so all intelligent animals could understand their stories, and since the language wasn't recorded in him, he can read it. These humans prepared for when their civilization wasn't there anymore. Observing the map, Sharon realizes they're on an island. The only island on Earth, so all mutant beasts gathered there. But in 179 days, it will sink too. The only way to survive is to stay in the shelter. Sharon concludes they have no ammunition or food, outside is full of monsters, and the only thing they can do is wait for death in the shelter. The girl definitely hasn't given up. She asks if there are any spare clothes to give to Howard, and the robot says he can take the clothes himself. Passing over the robot, Sharon explains he was left because he didn't know how to show how valuable he was to the humans, and doesn't want to end up the same way. Howard senses a presence behind him and turning around sees the robot asking not to be left behind. He pleads, saying he can still work clean, he just wants to stay with the humans. The robot remembers the time spent with humans and continues pleading that he's useful. Even without knowing what paradise is like, he'll make this place even cleaner than there. Howard lifts the robot and fits the piece that fell. He asks the robot how to fix it correctly, and the robot mentions a room where engineers used to repair robots. Howard says there are no engineers here, but he will try anyway. That's when he hears the door opening again, but this time it's Sharon who appears to take a shower too. She says the world is ending so there's no need to be ashamed. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and share with your friends. See you in the next video. Bye for now.